Good afternoon. I'm Patrick Lewis, the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's presentation about of the I Sing, the Contested History of American Patriotism. Benjamin Railton is Professor of English and American Studies at Fitchburg State University. He's the author of six books, most recently, of the I Sing. He also writes the Daily American Studier blog, contributes the bi-monthly Considering History column to the Saturday Evening Post, and is an active public scholarly tweeter. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Benjamin Railton. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, and thanks as well to Patrick for really making this event happen. I'm, I'm so glad to be connected to FHS and to you all. And Patrick is the reason for that. So thank you for that too. Thank you to Scott and Kyle and everybody at FHS for making it happen so smoothly. But most especially, thank you to you all for being here um, and, and being in conversation with me. I wish we could do it in that beautiful lecture hall that was pictured in the slideshow we were all just watching. But on the other hand, um, I get to join you all from Massachusetts um, here at the end of a semester, and you get to join from wherever you are, and we get to be in conversation together. And that's a pretty great thing, and I really value it. And the last thing I'll say before I, I switch over to my slides is I do see it as a conversation and not just a conversation today, although yes, and I hope in the Q&A part, you'll add your voice into the mix for sure. But as part of a longer conversation, all talks to me are part of a longer conversation. And so my last slide, for example, is my contact info. If you can't get it right then, uh, the talk will be on, on YouTube later and I'm pretty easy to find online. And I really hope you'll reach out and keep the conversation going beyond these few minutes today as well. That's entirely how I see moments like this. And I'm so glad to be in this part of the conversation with you all. So in that phrase that has defined our last couple of years, let me share my slides and we will get the conversation going. I guess the other uh, phrase is, I think you're on mute, but luckily I am not on mute. So um, we will get the conversation going here about that topic, which is the same title as, as the book that Patrick mentioned, The Contested History of American patriotism. And I'm mainly gonna focus on ideas and histories, but I do need to start with a more contemporary moment that can I think help us think about the stakes of having these conversations. And they are to my mind, very present and very high. It's been a last couple years or last five years or last decade of pretty consistent, intense conflict um, here in the United States and elsewhere, but certainly here in the US. But I think if there were one month that most embodies, most exemplifies those conflicts, it would have to be last January, January, 2021. And I don't just mean embodies because there were hugely conflicted moments in that month, although there were, and I'm talking briefly here about a couple of them on very different levels, but both very conflicted to be sure. But I also mean embodies because these moments were so clearly defined in relationship to some of the big ideas and debates that have, have really been at the center of, of all of these conflicts. And to me, patriotism is one such idea and, and debate around patriotism, what it means, how we think about it, who is and is not a patriot. Those questions have been pretty consistently central to the last couple of years of American conflicts and debates. And we see that really clearly in these January 2021 moments. So just a quick quote um, from, from two particularly striking such usages of patriotism in those January 2021 moments. One is a really provocative and important article in The Nation magazine, which covered a group of the participants in the January 6th insurrection in Washington, DC. Um, and as part of that article, the, the journalist quoted a woman who was one of the insurrectionists when police had begun to fire tear gas at, she, at her and her compatriots. And she noted, this is not America. They're shooting at us. They're supposed to shoot Black Lives Matter, but they're shooting the Patriots. And you can see there a couple of things, the self-identification as a Patriot, as a member of a patriotic community and action, and also the differentiation of an us from a them, that there are groups, including other protesters, of course, right, because that's what Black Lives Matter has had centrally been for many months leading up to that, who are not patriotic, who are the opposite of that, and thus are not American in that idea as well. So a lot of layers to the way Patriot and that quote are expressing different aspects of that woman. And I would argue that group and that events 
ideas and perspectives. A couple of weeks later, again, a very different kind of event, but another very conflicted one was the release of President Trump's 1776 commission report, uh, which was released on Martin Luther King Day, no less, in, in January 2021, and which in its self-definition and again in its, its uh, definition of an opposition really clearly used this idea of patriotism, defining its own goal, the project and report's own goal as restoring patriotic education, teaches the truth about America and defining it in opposition to these anti-American unpatriotic forces such as universities in the United States that generate at the very least disdain and at worst outright hatred. Again, the opposite of what would often be defined as patriotism. So a couple of striking January quotes and moments that really embody not just so many of our conflicts, but also I would argue the central role of patriotism and ideas and debates about patriotism in those conflicts. Well, it just so happened that a couple months after that, I had a book that was coming out that you've already heard a little bit about, that this is the cover of um, In Roman and Littlefield's American Ways series, a really great series centered around big American questions and ideas and concepts. And this, this project was focused on patriotism and specifically on how the history of that idea has never meant just one thing in America. It has always been contested. There have always been multiple and conflicted meanings and definitions that we can trace across our history and certainly think about in our current moment as well. Today, I'm gonna to talk briefly about a couple of layers to that for just a couple minutes each in these three sections. And then um, would love to hear your follow-up questions, ideas, further thoughts in the Q&A. And as I mentioned, certainly beyond my last slide is that contact info. I'm gonna start by briefly talking about the four main categories, the four main types that I try to define in this book, beginning in my intro and then carrying forward throughout the rest of the project, thinking about all four of these types. And strikingly to me, one particular song, a, a patriotic anthem of sorts, America the Beautiful, in its four verses, quickly, but I think strikingly depicts all four of these categories of patriotism. So I'll begin there to lay out a little bit about some of the different things that I mean when I talk about patriotism. And then I'm gonna use two particular kinds of case studies. One, one historical moment, and then one, a group of figures to talk about kind of the two central types that are at the heart of my project in conflict with each other, certainly contested uh, with each other. Uh, what I call mythic patriotism and thinking about how about a hundred years ago, was a hugely striking case, st case study in that type of mythic patriotism. And then it's alternative to my mind, critical patriotism and highlighting briefly just a few figures and texts that can embody how I want to, to define and think about that kind, that category of patriotism. So those are my three sections and then I look forward to continued conversation as I've mentioned. So starting with these four types, and I'm not going to read all the text on, on these slides. I wanted to give you a little bit of a snippet of, of, of how I think about these types, um, if you're able to take a look at them, and then if you're able to revisit them, if you're interested on YouTube or beyond. So the type of patriotism that I think we most often mean when we use the phrase in a shorthand way, in a quick way, is what I would call celebratory patriotism. Occasions, events, expressions of patriotic love of country um, in, in a kind of celebratory mode, in celebratory ways. Things like the singing of the national anthem or July 4th celebrations, um, as I mentioned here. Um, and I wanna be really clear that I don't see, and I don't in this project argue, that celebratory patriotism is necessarily problematic. It doesn't have to be. If anything, I would argue, it can be really inclusive, really shared an expression of pride in a shared community that all can be part of. Too often it turns into the second category that I'll get to in a second, which is very different, but it doesn't have to. I think celebratory patriotism has real collective value um, and can be really inclusive. Um, and one expression of that inclusive vision, I would say, is the first verse of America the Beautiful. Uh, Catherine Lee Bates, Wellesley, a college professor, English professor, was traveling the country by train in 1893. Um, to end up in Colorado where she was gonna teach a summer program. And she saw the beauties of the nation as she passed through and she composed a poem that became the lyrics to this pretty well-known now song. And the first verse really captures that celebratory perspective on that beautiful place that the song's title suggests. In, uh, some of the most famous lines, often the first verse is the only one performed, as is the case with many of our anthems, like the Star Spangled Banner as well. So we're pretty familiar with some of those phrases, some of those beauties, those celebratory patriotic images that she captures, the Purple Mountain Majesties, for example. And they are, of course, hyperbolic, right? The mountains aren't 
probably really purple. So it's a celebration that is idealized, but it's also a celebration that can be inclusive, that can be shared, that can be a collective sense of, of pride and, and awe in the beauty of a place. And that's that first versus image of what I would call celebratory patriotism, that type that is perhaps the most familiar and the most shorthand in the ways that we use this idea. As I say, I think celebratory patriotism can be very inclusive and shared, but very often in our history, it has not been. And the reason is the shift or the slippage into the second category that I wanted to find, the category that I call mythic patriotism. And mythic patriotism works in a couple of ways, as I see it. One level, and perhaps the most central one, is creating and depending on a very particular set of images of the United States about which we should be celebratory, which we should celebrate. A mythologized narrative of American history, American identity, um, that is the center far too often of our celebratory patriotisms. And I would go a step further and say that much of the time that mythic patriotism, those mythologized narratives have been white supremacist or at least very white centered in many different ways, leaving out as many American communities and histories and, and stories as they include. And then the second layer and perhaps the even more salient one to thinking about how mythic patriotism works in our history and in our present moment is that anyone who doesn't agree with that mythologized vision, who challenges it, critiques it, is defined as outside, not only of that patriotism, but outside of America, un-American, anti-American. That in the mythic patriotic narrative, if you are not fully endorsing that mythologized version, you are unpatriotic and anti-patriotic, as we saw in the 1776 Project's definition of its opposition. And the second verse of America the Beautiful doesn't do the second thing. It doesn't define anybody as unpatriotic or anti-patriotic at all, but it certainly captures what I would call a mythologized narrative, a mythic patriotic narrative, particularly of one particular origin of America, the arrival of the pilgrims, the Puritans here in, in Massachusetts, um, describing, for example, the pilgrim feet whose stern and passion stress a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. Now, defining the, the, the pilgrims as an origin point is already a kind of exclusionary mythologized narrative of American history, one that leaves out at least as many communities as it includes. But by describing the place where the pilgrims arrived as a wilderness, Bates and that verse go even further, explicitly leaving out, for example, the indigenous communities, the Native American people who were present there, whom the pilgrims met so, so immediately and depended on so fully. So again, it's not the most exclusionary form of mythic patriotism, that second verse, but it, it reflects the idea of a mythologized national narrative as part of what is or the center of what is being celebrated. And that's the second category. And I'll return to uh, one particular case study in a couple minutes of the many layers of how mythic patriotism can work and can exclude so fully so many Americans. So celebratory isn't necessarily problematic to me, but it can slide very easily into mythic patriotism and become exclusionary and limiting. So my third and fourth categories represent alternatives particularly alternatives to mythic patriotism, but also alternatives in some ways to celebratory patriotism's limits. B uh, both of them, as I say in the middle of this slide, are ways of thinking about patriotism not as a passive accepted celebration of existing histories or myths, but as a more active ongoing process that we all have to participate in that challenges some of those myths and pushes in a different direction, pushes in fact toward a more inclusive and more genuinely ideal vision of the nation. The third category is what I call active patriotism, which is actions that are taken in service of or sacrifice for some of those patriotic ideals. And in my project, I think a lot about military service for sure, but there are lots of such actions that can be taken in service and sacrifice of a patriotic vision of the nation, including protest for sure. I would argue that protest is very consistently a form of active patriotism. The third verse of America the Beautiful does uh, define a military service um, as, a, as its patriotic emphasis, specifically Civil War military service, and more specifically and importantly for how I want to define this category, the service of US Army soldiers in that Civil War on behalf of the freedom for which the war was ultimately fought. So Bates writes there that it's the beautiful for heroes who proved in liberating strife that more than self their country loved. And that liberating strife phrase is really key. Defining the war, as I would too, as a, ultimately a, a battle for freedom, particularly enslaved African-Americans freedom, 
defines then the military service, the act of patriotism of those who fought and particularly those who died in the US Army as contributing toward that idealized next step, toward pushing the nation closer to its ideals. So Bates wants to think about US Army service that way. I wanna think about a lot of different service and sacrifice throughout US history as examples of this active patriotism. And then relatedly, but differently as well as my fourth category and my other most central one alongside mythic patriotism and in direct opposition in many ways to mythic patriotism, which is the form that I call critical patriotism. A patriotism that is about highlighting the nation's failures or flaws or shortcomings, the gaps between its ideals and its realities in an effort with a goal of pushing the nation forward toward closer toward those ideals, toward that more perfect union. Um, a, a riff a bit on what Howard Zinn um, famously quoted, dissent is the highest form of patriotism, that to dissent is not simply to challenge, it is to express one's love, one's critical love in an attempt to make the thing one loves more like its best self, more like its most ideal vision. Um, and the fourth verse, the final verse of America the Beautiful, interestingly, if briefly, gestures, I think, at the idea of this critical patriotism. Bates writes there that America the Beautiful for a patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. Now you could think about this as a, a religious reference in part, the idea of a kind of heavenly future, but this is a patriot dream that Bates is quoting here. It's not a Christian dream, it's not a spiritual dream, it's a patriot dream of a future that is better than the present, that is undimmed by the tears of, of this present moment. And the 1890s were certainly a moment of intense tears and conflicts in a variety of ways with which Bates was intimately familiar and concerned. So thinking about a dream of a future that is something better than the present, and of course to get there requires fighting for it, working toward it, and that requires challenging all the ways in which we are not there. So briefly gesturing there at what I would argue much more fully in the project is this fourth type, this type of critical patriotism. In each of my chapters in the project, I trace all four types in eight different historical moments from the revolutionary period up through the 1980s. And then I come up to the 21st century in my conclusion. Today, I'm gonna to focus in, in, in my last two sections on a couple particular lenses for thinking about, especially my two most explicitly contested types, mythic and then critical patriotism, although I'll be happy to talk about all of these and anything else that you might be interested in or want to add into the mix. So when we think about mythic patriotism, I try to trace it across all eight of my time periods and certainly into the present moment. But I think 100 years or so ago, the 19 teens and 20s were a particularly striking example of how mythic patriotism is created, how it works, how it excludes so many different Americans in so many different ways through these mythic patriotic expressions. And that really starts with the president of the US in the 19 teens and, and with a couple of laws that he pushed for and argued for very overtly for many years, the laws that became the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act, especially of 1918. And President Woodrow Wilson, it's worth being really clear, was arguing for these laws long before the US was involved in World War I. They're often defined as wartime laws, and we do see expressions of mythic patriotism often amplified during times of war, for sure. But Wilson was arguing for these laws when the US was still neutral and not in any way involved in World War I. So these aren't just wartime ideas. This mythic patriotism began before that and began with very specific definitions of who was and was not part of America and how to try to exclude those who were not and amplify those who were in this narrative. We see that in Wilson's 1915 State of the Union delivered in December 1915, um, where he argues that there are citizens of the US who have immigrated to the US and been welcomed under our, as he puts it, generous naturalization laws, who pour the poison of disloyalty into the very arteries of our national life. And that passing these laws that Wilson was arguing for to Congress is doing nothing less than saving the honor and self-respect, the very kind of core identity and attributes of the United States, that these are un-American, anti-American forces, treasonous, disloyal forces, and passing these laws is necessary to more fully exclude them and, and safeguard this, this um, we that he is defining, this American identity. Congress debated those laws for some time, but it did eventually pass both the Espionage and Sedition Acts in 1917 and 1918. And the Sedition Act in particular is about as explicit a legal reflection of mythic patriotism, of that us versus them and that attempt to exclude any criticism 
of the us that is being created as I've ever encountered. It made illegal, for example, any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States and other things, or the flag of the United States. Any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language. Think how purposely broad those categories are, how virtually any challenge, critique, alternative perspective could fall and did fall in that period under this incredibly capacious definition of what is sedition, of what is un-American, anti-American um, in this mythic patriotic image. And we can see how that got applied at a number of different moments um, after the passage of these laws. But one really striking such moment involved a silent film called The Spirit of 76. Um, which was a silent film, a historical epic portraying the Revolutionary War, as you would expect from the title. Because it portrayed the Revolutionary War, of course, it portrayed the English as adversaries, as, as, as the enemy um, to the colonists, to the revolutionary forces. But at this time, the, the English had become allies of the US as the US then entered into World War I in particular. And so by producing this film, the uh, Jewish American German immigrant named Robert Goldstein, who was the producer, was committing sedition under the, the, the aegis of this law as, as the law was applied to him. He was brought to trial for sedition. He was convicted. He was sentenced to a decade in prison. And at his sentencing, the judge of that trial, Benjamin Bledsoe, not only entirely seconded all of those steps, but in fact argued that, that Goldstein was lucky, that he should count himself lucky that he didn't commit treason in a country that didn't have America's freedoms. He'd already be dead. So you can see here the really explicitly exclusionary and discriminatory logic of this mythic patriotic law and these mythic patriotic narratives and the way they can define any perspective, any voice, any work that is perceived as at all outside of that mythic patriotic we as seditious, as disloyal, as worthy even of execution, at least imprisonment. Um, a really striking individual example of many in that era of the application of these mythic patriotic laws to exclude many, many American individuals and communities. And then uh, these mythic patriotic narratives over the next decade or so into the 1920s really uh, reached their tendrils out into many different issues, many different layers of American identity, American society, American culture. Um, uh, one such layer were the uh, narratives, the arguments in opposition to organized labor, to the labor movement and labor activism, which likewise used this mythic patriotic frame to define this American we, and to define American labor as a threat, a seditious, treasonous, existential threat to that America, to that we. We see that, for example, in this February speech by a Methodist uh, minister, Bishop William Quayle at a Baltimore church. Quayle had become pretty well known in World War I as expressing also various forms of mythic patriotism and exclusion. But after the war, he becomes particularly known as this anti-labor voice and activist. And in this famous speech, he defines organized labor not just as, well, problem for corporations or work or the economy, but as a challenge against all that we have and are in government. And I would argue really he means the United States as a whole, they're all that we have and are. And as such, it is our duty as American citizens, Quayle argues, to accept the challenge and crush the labor movement, crush this foe to our most cherished ideals. Defining again this opposition as not only outside of, but directly the foe of us of this American we, um, and that if we don't, they will banish political liberty from the land. They will end the American experiment. Now, of course, it's worth noting the irony here, the hypocrisy of arguing to banish liberty in the name of uh, protecting such liberty. But the broader idea here is this us versus them, this patriotic, mythic patriotic vision of an American we, of these forces in opposition to it as anti-patriotic, unpatriotic, un-American, in need of of fighting to save that we. And that led among other things to a corporate plan that became a pretty widespread uh, plan in the 1920s called the American Plan, very tellingly, which first the National Association of Manufacturers and then other um, corporate entities and organizations adopted to try to not only limit uh, labor movement activism, but to use violence, to use employed um, violence, uh, kind of mercenary armies to attack labor activists and labor actions. Um, so again, the use of explicit violence as well as rhetorical violence to define these forces as un-American in that American plan as Quayle was in his speech. One additional layer of that mythic patriotism, we certainly and relatedly saw that play out as well in, in the many different narratives around the period that became known as the Red Scare, the fears, the narratives of 
socialism, communism, Bolshevism, all these related phrases, as another set of threats to the United States. But it's worth being really clear that many, if not most, of those perceived and defined by this narrative as threats were not, say, from the new Soviet Union or any other country. They were from the United States being defined as un-American, anti-American in these ways. That happened, for example, in Seattle in 1919, where there was a general strike of, of workers taking place there and a newspaper warned them to stop because this is America, not Russia. And the mayor of Seattle at the time, Ole Hansen, explicitly used that mythic patriotic lens. The time has come for the people to show their Americanism, to oppose these forces, these implicitly un-American forces. And he made that even more explicit in the title of this book of his, Americanism versus Bolshevism. Again, critiquing fellow Americans as outside of that American identity, that Americanism. And the president and others did so as well uh, later that year in response to a police strike in Boston, a pretty prominent uh, labor action that took place in September 1919. Uh, Wilson called that action a crime against civilization, going even further in the us versus them in the who is in the we and who is not civilization and its opponents in that frame. And then in terms of exclusionary mythic patriotism, an editorial in an Ohio newspaper made the stakes of that really clear, arguing that when a policeman st strikes, he should be debarred not only from the job, but from citizenship as well. And that was a real thing that happened in this era was uh, the the idea that I highlight at the top of this slide, ideological deportation, wasn't the first time, but it became a hugely prominent policy and goal of, of the government during this era to enforce this mythic patriotism and to deport and even strip the citizenship at times from those who had who were perceived as, as outside of that we as threats to that mythic patriotic identity. It's a great recent book by Julia Rose Kraut called Threat of Dissent about the long history of ideological deportation, but certainly about this era as a particular um, locus for it. Um, it happens to Emma Goldman, for example, the prominent activist and, and author among many, many others. But there's also a broader way in which this mythic patriotic narrative gets tied to anti-immigrant perspectives and eventually anti-immigrant laws. In fact, the first laws in the United States that are truly comprehensive national immigration laws. Um, a building on things like the Chinese Exclusion Act, which I've talked about in many other projects for many years, which is 1882. But it's only in the 1920s that we truly have our first comprehensive national immigration laws. The Quota Acts, they have other names as well, but the Quota Acts of 1921, the Emergency Quota Act, and then the more full and permanent at the time Quota Act of 1924. And these laws are created entirely to discriminate, against various communities of arrivals, various national immigrant communities, and to discriminate because of this mythic patriotic narrative of us and them. And we see that really clearly in a speech given by one of the 1924 laws, um, co-sponsor South Carolina Senator Ellison Durant Smith. It's a, a long speech, every moment of which expresses this mythic patriotic exclusionary attitude. These are just a couple of examples. He makes the case why the time has arrived when we should shut the door, for example, by defining what America is, what has characterized us, as he puts it. And that is pure, unadulterated Anglo-Saxon stock. And it is for the preservation of that splendid stock that has characterized us that he is arguing for this law. So again, a mythic patriotic definition of America, white supremacist vision of who we are, who we have always been, used to then seek to exclude all who are not part of that we, and ties that as well to these American ideals in the second quote I highlight here. American progress, the genius of our government, the opportunities that lie about us. All of these have to be safeguarded, Smith is arguing, by passing this exclusionary discriminatory immigration law. Let us keep what we have, protect what we have, make it the realization of the dream of those who wrote the constitution. All these layers of a mythic patriotic definition of America, vision of us, and then of this attempt this goal of excluding all those who are outside of that mythic patriotic definition, all part of the rise of those national immigration laws in the 20s. And then uh, the way that dissenters are treated in this period is just one more clear expression of this mythic patriotism. Um, uh, these are both huge events that I'll just very briefly touch on, but the Red Summer, which really was a year long um, a set of racial terrorist massacres and lynchings of African Americans throughout the US, um, often focused explicitly, as that one photo indicates, on African American World War I veterans who, in their very identity, represented a different vision of America and American patriotism, um, and in their uniform even more so, and yet were really consistently the initial targets of these lynchings and massacres by white supremacists who, of course, 
subscribe to a very different vision. And similarly, the way the silent sentinels were treated, the uh, suffrage activists who protested in Washington, DC for years um, on behalf of women's suffrage and who were again and again arrested, beaten, um, tortured in one particularly famous event, the November 1917 night of torture, as it was called, or night of horror, as it was called, um, where a group of these silent sentinels were imprisoned in um, a Virginia prison, Akuguan workhouse, and tortured throughout the night by, by prison guards and other officials. Um, and again, treated as enemies of the US because of, of their descent, their descent from some of these ideals. But to transition to critical patriotism, my last topic, they persist even in the face of such treatment. And here are two examples from those particular, related to those particular moments. One of them is a wonderful column by W.E. Du Bois in his new uh, crisis magazine that he founded and was editing for the NAACP, um, a column called Returning Soldiers about those returning World War I African-American veterans um, who returned from fighting and as Du Bois put it, returned fighting to save not only democracy abroad as Du Bois ended his column, but the United States as well. So a critical patriotic vision of what those African-American soldiers and veterans and critical patriots represented and could be and do in the US in this very different vision from the mythic patriotic one. And I would say the same about Alice Paul, one of the main of those silent sentinel protesters who a, a doctor who was treating her after a hunger strike during one of her imprisonments noted, had a spirit like Joan of Arc and it is useless to try to change it. She will die, but she will never give up, willing to sacrifice even her life in an active and critical patriotic way on behalf of the ideals that she was fighting for and that she was trying to push the nation toward. Certainly an example, I would argue, of both active and critical patriotism as those African-American World War I soldiers in their own way were as well. And that's my third and final topic for today is just to spend a few minutes highlighting a few other examples of this alternative. Again, I have four total categories and they're all worth, I believe, exploring and thinking about and connecting to our history and our present. But at the heart of this project is this, this conflict, this contest between mythic patriotism and critical patriotism. A patriotism that argues no, to challenge the myths, to challenge those narratives is not to be unpatriotic. It is instead a deep-seated form of patriotism that uses such challenges in an attempt to both highlight the darkest sides and push the nation toward its more ideal, more perfect union. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple examples across the 19th, 20th and 21st centuries, very briefly of what I would call critical patriotism. And I trace this across all my uh, chapters and time periods in the book up to the present moment and would be happy to, to keep talking about and sharing examples of, of the legacies of critical patriotism throughout our history. So in the 19th century, the two that I'm gonna briefly highlight are these two men, William Apes, sometimes pronounced Apesh, a uh, Native American minister, orator, essayist, activist, and uh, obviously uh, the better known of these two, Fre Frederick Douglass, the escaped uh, fugitive um, enslaved person turned abolitionist, civil rights activist, educator, author, diplomat, and much more besides. And I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting very particularly for just a second here, one text of each of theirs. Critical patriotism takes place in a variety of contexts, certainly including protest and activism of various kinds, but there are many texts that really sum it up. And I'm just gonna very briefly point to a few of them across these next couple examples. Apes, for example, has a really amazing speech called Eulogy on King Philip, which is his last public speech in a tragically short life before he passes away a few years later. It's delivered at the Odeon Theater in the heart of Boston, right at the time of the sort of first real surge of revolutionary collective memory. And in that moment, in that place, in that speech, Apes argues that King Philip, or Metacomet, the Wampanoag chief from best known for King Philip's War, the 1670s conflict between the Wampanoag and the, and the English, argues that he is a, a patriotic American founder, that he should be seen as, as part of the legacy of American identity and patriotism. Um, and that not only by his descendants, by Native Americans like Apes and, and, and his peers, but Apes argues in the speech that every patriot, every patriot should appreciate and hold in memory King Philip, this Wampanoag leader as this, um, as this embodiment of our ideals, of our histories um, at their best, a cause as glorious as the American Revolution, APES says. And this is all just from the beginning of a speech that goes on um, for some time on multiple really impressive layers. But even just the act of delivering that speech of arguing for a Wampanoag chief as an American ancestor is a really powerful example of critical patriotism in the 1830s. 
15 years later or so, Frederick Douglass delivers one of the best single expressions of critical patriotism in American history with his speech, What to the Slave is the 4th of July. He was invited to deliver that speech to celebrate the 4th of July by a Rochester group that was his hometown at the time. But he uses the occasion to turn the lens back on the invitation, back on his audience, and back on the gaps between America's ideals and its realities there in 1852 arguing, for example, that to drag him, to drag a man in fetters, and again, he was an escaped, but, but still at any time legally able to be recaptured into slavery individual, to drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty, these mythic patriotic ideals, and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems or inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony, highlighting those gaps. And yet both of these men end really explicitly with the patriotic side, the collective side, the ideals that they are pushing the nation toward through their critical patriotism. APES does by arguing that what we have to do is to try to move forward together, you and I, his presumably white audience, his own perspective, all of us together, to move forward together into peace and righteousness as a whole, as a collective. And Douglas goes further still in his conclusion, arguing that he does not despair, that he has hope, and that that hope comes in part from America's ideals, the Declaration, the genius of American institutions, and from his hope that collectively we can begin to move together closer to those ideals by, among other things, certainly abolishing slavery in that moment. So these are arguments that are deeply critical, yet are also critical patriotism, I would argue, expressing a hope, a goal, an ideal of an American community that they are seeking to push the nation toward through their efforts. Up into the 20th century, I want to quote quickly from two of the 20th century's best expressions of critical patriotism by these two authors, um, amazing 20th century American authors, Langston Hughes and James Baldwin. Hughes's is from a poem of his that is also on my short list of the best critical patriotic American texts, Let America Be America Again from 1936. Um, and the way the poem works even structurally really expresses the back and forth between mythic patriotism and critical patriotism. So the, the first half of the poem has these kind of mythic patriotic ideals in the verses in the stanzas, like the dream America used to be. But then there are these parenthetical responses from another speaker, an African-American speaker, challenging those myths. America never was America to me. There's never been equality for me nor freedom in this homeland of the free. But then the poem as a whole is an argument for those ideals still, for pushing toward them through, for example, that voice and that poem itself. And yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Again, a critical patriotic argument for recognizing those gaps, even embodying them in the poem's form, but pushing toward that ideal vision. And then the single best quote to sum up critical patriotism I've ever encountered, which is the epigraph for my book, was delivered by James Baldwin in his essay, uh, the title essay of his 1955 collection, Notes on a Native Son. I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually exactly for this reason, right? The love and the criticism are interconnected. They are dependent upon one another. And in a 1954 preface to that book, to a new edition of that book, Baldwin defined what he was doing precisely as challenging that exclusionary mythic patriotism, um, the brutal and specific exclusion of Baldwin and his people from that version of America, but doing so through American ideals still, to locate myself within a specific inheritance and to use it to claim that birthright, to challenge that mythic exclusion. And then I'm gonna very briefly come up to the present moment so we can have time to talk further. Just a couple examples of critical patriotism here in the 21st century, as I would argue it, um, one of whom was on the cover of my book and Colin Kaepernick and the other of whom um, expressed that active and critical patriotism just in the last a couple years, uh, very famously. Um, Kaepernick, I just wanna be really clear about because so often he's been a target because of the same mythic patriotic narratives I traced in my second section, defining him as un-American, unpatriotic, as, as a seditious, treasonous force. But from his very first actions, his very first kneeling, um, and his very first statements about it, he expressed his actions as critical patriotism. You see that in this quote from a Yahoo Sports interview. To me, this is something that has to change, speaking about racial inequality and discrimination and violence. And when there's significant change, and I feel like that flag represents what it's supposed to represent, I'll stand. So pushing the nation toward those ideals um, through action, through protest, through his voice. 
certainly critical patriotism as I would define it. And then Vindman, a very different type that we can certainly also call active, his um, a whistleblowing and brave, a courageous testimony um, against um, uh, various actions by the Trump administration in 1919 into 1920. Um, and he ties that again to his vision of the ideals of America that had led his father to immigrate to the US from the Ukraine, for example, from the Soviet Union at the time, seeking the ideals, uh, seeking um, uh, the nation, um, that he envisioned. Um, and, and in Vindman's life, he defined his own choices to be an American public servant as an expression of that vision, that idealized vision of the nation. But he also defined his testimony, his whistleblowing and testimony as that same vision, uh, the sense of duty and service that compelled him to be critical in that moment and to try to push the nation closer to its ideals and challenge the failures of, of that time and, and connected that finally and movingly to his father and to his father's ideal vision of America that had brought the family here. And that Vindman saw himself and his whistleblowing and his testimony as embodying and helping to carry forward. Another really powerful expression, I would say, of critical patriotism. As I end, I'll leave up my contact info for a second so you can get it down if you need to. And I'll just end on this note. Throughout the year since January, 2021, we have seen again and again, I would argue, the centrality of patriotism to these unfolding, constant, consistent, seemingly ever-growing conflicts and debates. And at the very least, the first step in really grappling with those moments is to take a step back and realize that we don't just mean one thing. There are multiple definitions, multiple visions, multiple ideas of patriotism. And there have always been throughout US history. We can't begin to grapple with where we are today and with the role that patriotism plays in those debates unless we can also really think more more fully and collectively about those multiple meanings, those multiple histories and legacies, what we can learn from them, how we are continuing to be affected by and in conversation with them in the present. And ultimately, I would argue, certainly allowing for the possibility that patriotism is at least as much about criticism and protest and activism as it is about celebration. Thank you. I'm going to end there and I look forward to your questions and conversation. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for that, that really fantastic lecture. And I know we've got a couple of questions in here, and I've got a whole bunch as well. I encourage uh, everyone on the call to, to put your questions in the chat, um, too. And the, the couple of comments and questions that we have so far relate to teaching and education. Um, how do you, do you teach these? You know, what's the reception of, of sort of being presented with this spectrum of, of manifestations of patriotism uh, among your students? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question, because, um, and not just because this is the last week of a semester, but teaching is always central to, to my thoughts as well, and I really appreciate that link. And what I would say first is the number one thing I try to do in teaching any American literature class, American history class, American studies class is present these voices, these texts, these figures, these histories, right? Just give students, give all of us more and more of these of all of these, these figures, these texts, these histories. And I think to connect to another debate in the moment, my biggest problem with a lot of the current attacks on education is that the goal is to limit what we are presenting, to limit what we are including, um, when that's so integral to thinking about all these questions, right? Is getting as much in front of us as we can have. So that's kind of my fundamental goal is, is not to, you know, I'm not teaching the categories in any overt way, I would say. I'm, I'm highlighting, I'm sharing these figures and texts and histories and stories, giving them to all of us to grapple with and to think about. But to take that one step further, yes, I think to be an educator in any context, including historical societies and public conversations and everywhere else, all of us in 21st century America is in itself a form of critical patriotism because it requires that we grapple with all the hardest things and that we're doing that because we're trying to move us forward together. We're trying to help us move forward together. So I would hope that these classes, the work students are doing, the things they're responding to and thinking about are allowing them to become not only a more part of a civic American identity, but their own version of something like critical patriotism, where they can grapple with everything in front of us and keep the hope that requires us to move forward. So I'm not being overt about that. The goal is to give as much as we can and talk about it together. But I think doing that work is critical patriotism. And I think certainly students are embodying that through the work that they do. And that's always a part of why I come back to it and why it gives me such hope to work with, with students doing that. I had a, a, a sort of flashback at one point during your talk um, to a, a book that I found a long time ago in a 19th century wealthy Kentucky library, and it was a Greek language biography of George Washington. 
um, that have been published in the, the early 1820s, right about the time of their revolution. And, and my Greek was good enough that I could I could basically make out the, the introduction there where it was meant to inspire with these revolutionary uh, ideals, um, the, 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 uh, the war against the Turks. And I, I thought about this sort of cyclical nature of, of these ideas. And I wonder if you trace at all um, some of the reception of these ideas of American patriotism abroad and how they, um, they go out, how they're received uh, elsewhere in the world and maybe how they echo back uh, to us in the country. That's a great connection and a great question. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I haven't in any, in any a systematic way or organized way um, uh, thought about outside of the US in this context yet. But what I would say is my number one interest kind of throughout my whole career is collective memory, national narrative, the way that, that American identity is constructed and defined and debated. And I think there are other countries too. I don't wanna be an American exceptionalist, but America is a country where those national narratives, those collective memories, those, those definitions, those debates have extended out into the world more and more, right? They certainly did even in that earliest post-revolutionary moment, as you're noting, the 20th century, of course, in many ways was defined by that influence in all the different ways, positive, negative, and everywhere in between. And so I think in debating and thinking about American collective national narratives and identity, we are also thinking about the meaning of that. And you can see that in Vindman's remarks that I ended with there, the meaning of that for his father, for their family, the meaning of those ideals. But then what I would argue really strongly is that in that moment of testimony, Vindman was both reflecting the ways the nation falls short of those ideals, right? The ways it, it can be as flawed as any to be sure, but also carrying them forward more than any revolutionary leader could in, in a lot of ways. So I do think those narratives, those ideals are ones that have echoed into the world, um, but at times in more limiting ways. And so the, to me, the best example of pushing them forward would be those from everywhere in the world who both challenge and then seek to contribute to them, right? Rather than simply being inspired by them while inspiration is great, who can also see the US in all its complexity and then say, and how can we help push it forward? Whether by coming to the US or just um, from anywhere in the world. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was thinking too, along this theme of education about, um, you know, especially in the past year, sort of sitting at home as my, my son was doing online classes, <laughs> uh, as we all did, and thinking about the, the crystallization of, of a critical patriotism into a mythical patriotism and how quickly that can occur and how quickly that can sort of, um, you know, blunt or defang the, the criticisms embedded in. I'm thinking about the, the Rosa Parks myth, you know, she, she was just really tired instead of being a committed activist who had worked and trained for this. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that process of, of, of sort of mythologizing and other manifestations of it. Yeah, and another civil rights example from right around that same period, of course, that's really striking to me that way is Martin Luther King. Um, and so I had a piece in my Saturday Evening Post column when this book was about to come out, specifically focused on the civil rights movement as a moment of critical patriotism, in part because of that, because it has, has gotten turned into a kind of more sanitized at times and certainly more celebratory version of itself. And I think the March on Washington speech is a great specific example, right? Um, that speech is is best known for that one powerful image of, 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 of the dream of the future where we are judged by the, the content of our character. But King opens that speech with this incredibly impassioned, angry critique of the lack of progress over 100 years from the Emancipation Proclamation to 1963, right? Saying it's been 100 years since the Emancipation Proclamation, and here are all the ways we have fallen short. Here are all the ways the nation has not has not moved toward its ideals enough. Um, and then eventually does come back around to these idealized goals, these idealized visions. So I would call that speech a really sort of perfect embodiment of critical patriotism. Here are the failings, here's how we can try to move forward. But King has gotten turned into so often this kind of sanitized figure of just the celebratory side, just the, the idealized side, rather than recognizing the ways he was seeking to advance those multiple layers. Um, and yeah, I think that happens really frequently that when these movements that are critical patriotic or active patriotic movements of protest of dissent, um, if they are not simply excluded, they can get folded into the more celebratory narrative in a way that is partly good. It's good to celebrate Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks as Americans, fundamental defining Americans, but that needs to, to recognize the multiple uh, perspectives that they brought to that, the critical patriotism, for example, that they brought 
to their efforts as something to celebrate as well. That's the other thing I would say, right? I think we don't do that in part because it's seen as divisive. It's seen as, as troubling rather than something to be celebrated. And again, if we remember the legacy of critical patriotism at every moment in our history, we can start to celebrate it as part of who we are, as definingly American, rather than again, as something outside or threatening in any way. Uh, a very thought provoking question that's come in through the chat here. Um, thinking specifically about current events, though you could ask this question about any uh, time period, I'm sure, is, is um, celebratory patriotism on its own uh, an existential threat to uh, American freedom? Um, I mean, this is why I try to differentiate, and people might say this is a semantic difference, but I don't think it is. I think there are teeth to this difference. I try to differentiate nationalism from patriotism. I think nationalism is really dangerous. And I think of nationalism as the real us versus them kind of mentality. You know, the, my country right or wrong, um, America against the world, we are the best and everybody else is, is lesser and even threatening to us. All of those kind of narratives to me are part of what I would call nationalism. And nationalism I think is a threat, is a threat to all of us ultimately because it leads to war, it leads to destruction, it leads to all the kinds of exclusions that we're talking about here. Um, I don't think celebratory patriotism has to do that, although it, it certainly can. But I think there are ways to have pride, collective pride in a place that, for example, doesn't then say everywhere else is worse, much less a threat, that just says, here are things that we collectively are proud of and, and want to be linked by in celebration of together in our place, like you could do in a town or a school or a state or whatever. And, and, and without then creating the us versus them, just saying, here's part of what makes us something I want to be proud of um, and to keep fighting for that best vision of, that, that ideal vision of. Um, but that fight is not against them. It's not against others. It's, it's to keep pushing us forward to be that thing that we're celebrating. So I do want to differentiate it. And again, I think there's slippage a lot of the time, but I think nationalism is very dangerous. Um, and it always has been, it certainly has been in the last decade or more. But I think celebratory patriotism, while it can become that, can also be more inclusive and less um, chauvinistic is the word that I might use for that, right? That us versus them, that prejudicial side. It doesn't have to be that, I don't think, um, but it, it can. And it's worth always being aware and thinking about how we are expressing those celebrations and how we are including or excluding. I think it can often come down to that as simply. Um, if we can say, here are the things I love about the United States and here is the world that it's part of, for example, rather than the United States stands alone in that world as this one thing worth celebrating. Those are two very different starting points. I was trying to think through a little bit um, as we're always thinking here about our institutional past at the Filson and our legacy and what that means for us um, today. And, and, you know, I was trying to sort of categorize our, our institutional history <laughs> at some point during your talk and thinking back to this, the moment in the 1880s when the Filson is founded is, um, you know, trying to, to, to leverage a mythical patriotism, this narrative of the, the frontier West. Um, that, that's trying desperately to reunite um, a, a fractured white community that had been torn apart by the Civil War. Um, and, and, you know, and then, you know, sort of implicitly, and I think we're, we're sort of growing to become more aware of this over time, you know, implicitly blunt the efforts of African Americans and, and immigrants here in Louisville to sort of manifest different versions of American patriotism within that by celebrating this, this Anglo um, settler narrative. Um, and we think a lot about how that has shaped our collections, so the fundamental ways that, that scholars get to know the past through the, the diaries and the, the manuscripts and the portraits and the, the textiles and everything we have, as well as those things that we don't. I wondered in your research process, um, did you find it more difficult to find, uh, especially as you moved further back in time, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, examples of different categories of patriotism that might have sort of fallen through the cracks a lot of times? Yes, absolutely. And I'll give you a Massachusetts example in particular from the revolutionary chapter, my first chapter. Um, many of the people in that revolutionary period who I want to highlight as particularly impressive, active and critical patriots, my later categories, my challenge categories, are enslaved African-Americans who fought for the ideals of the new United States and the revolution and, and, and for them, for their identities as part of that place. 
um, to argue that they were included fully in that new nation and under those ideals, despite all the ways they were being excluded. I'm a huge advocate for better remembering that community in that moment. And it happens in Massachusetts really strikingly. There are enslaved people, because Massachusetts is a slave state at the time as they all are, and there are enslaved people who petition in 1777, arguing that the Declaration of Independence should apply to them and that their enslavement is not legal in this new United States. Um, and there are these two figures I write a lot about, Elizabeth Freeman and Quack Walker, who are enslaved African-Americans in mass who use the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution, which builds on the Declaration, to argue for their freedom, to argue against their enslavement under these new American ideals. Um, but then the example that really highlights the difficulty of remembering these histories sometimes is um, perhaps the most famous of the figures, but ironically one who it's very hard to learn much about, uh, Crispus Attucks. Um, who's best known as that first casualty of the revolution, first person or one of the people killed at the Boston Massacre in 1770. But he's a fugitive slave. He's an escaped enslaved person. He's born into slavery in Framingham, Massachusetts, not far from where I am right now, um, on a farm in Framingham. His father's an enslaved African-American there. His mother's a Native American woman, possibly enslaved. We don't know because there's so little information historically in the record. We do know that he runs away from slavery when he's about 22 or three. We know that because his master keeps putting advertisements in the newspaper to try to, to have him recaptured into slavery for about 20 years. That's between about 1750 and 1770. But he remains escaped. He remains um, able to be a fugitive, finds work as a merchant sailor uh, there in the Boston docks and ends up finding his way to that protest on King Street in 1770 that becomes known as the Boston Massacre. And I would argue how much more that would have meant to him because of all that history and story to be a fugitive slave for two decades and then to take part in an event against the British and against the monarchy and tyranny as it was already being put, of course, would mean even more to someone in that state in that situation. But we know so little about him because of all these gaps, because of how hard it is to remember someone I would define as an embodiment of revolutionary active and critical patriotism. And the same with Elizabeth Freeman, Quack Walker even more so, um, how little is known. Those petitioners are anonymous in 1777. Very few of them are known well. How little we know about many of these embodiments compared to you know, John Adams in, in Massachusetts, who as a lawyer defends the British soldiers after the Boston Massacre. It's his job. I'm not necessarily criticizing him, but we know a lot more about him, infinitely more about him than we do about Crispus Attucks, who takes part in that early revolutionary action as a fugitive slave, to me, a, a real embodiment of revolutionary American patriotism. So yes, it's incredibly difficult to find evidence. And at times we have to extrapolate or imagine things, you know, historians, biographers have worked really hard to find things, but there are a lot of gaps. But these figures and these histories and stories need to be remembered and, and, and made a part of the conversation, even if there are always perhaps gonna be those gaps because of the way the, the historiography and the memory has developed. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, just to, to wrap up, I know we've got um, lots of folks in the comments who are really excited to, to read this and your other books. I wonder if you could uh, share with us what maybe some of your upcoming projects are. What can we look forward to next? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm working on a, on a book right now um, that I'm hoping will be done in the, the new year and, and, and get out there. Um, and that is about another moment that really embodies these conflicts, this contested moment, um, these contested moments. It's a project called Two Sandlots, which is about two spaces in San Francisco around 1880, which embody sort of exclusion and inclusion in that place, in that time and overall. One is the site of a series of anti-Chinese uh, speeches by an Irish American immigrant who becomes kind of the leader of that anti-Chinese movement and is delivering these speeches in a, a place called the Sandlot in San Francisco. And then, just a year after that or so, um, there's a baseball game played on a sandlot in San Francisco between a local team, an Oakland uh, professional or semi-pro team, and a team from the Chinese Educational Mission, which is a group of, of young Chinese American men who've been studying in Connecticut and New England, um, are forced to make their way west when their school closes during the, the exclusion era, but who play this last baseball game in San Francisco in 1881 against this Oakland team. So using those two sandlots, those two spaces to think about these American conflicts and these different visions of our history and who we are. That's what I'm working on next. And I'm excited to, to keep sharing these, these histories and stories. That sounds really incredible. And may all of uh, our Pilsen speakers be blessed with your productivity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, Ben Railton. And thanks for everyone for, for joining and posing some really great questions. We really do appreciate it. I encourage everyone to pick up a copy of, of the I Sing uh, and follow Ben on all of his social media for more great content.
everybody have a great afternoon. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks Patrick and FHS.